Okay, we're going to come to the Dead Sea Scrolls, but uh, it's going to take a few minutes uh, until, uh, until we get there. We're going to begin with this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha in Tzatzava, we learn about the garments of the Koyen Gadol, and one of the garments of the Koyen Gadol was the tzitz that he would wear on his forehead. So let's read about the tzitz in the Gemara. So the Gemara says as follows, we'll look at the first source. Tzitz came in tachshels of, it was like a plate of gold, the roichav shtei at voice, and the width, meaning from here to here, was two fingers width. Umukaf may oizen la oizen, and it would go from ear to ear, it would wrap around the whole front of the head from one ear to the other ear. The kasuv alav the base shitin, and it would say in two rows, yud hey lamaila, shem havaya, it would say on the upper row. Uh, we understand this to mean the whole Shem Havaya, all four letters, Yud, Hey, and Avav, Hey, just the Gemara didn't want to write out all four. So it had Hashem's name on the upper row, the Kodesh Lamed Lamata, and Kodesh Lamed under it. In other words, it was supposed to say Kodesh Hashem, sanctified, meaning to, to, to symbolize that the Koyen Gadol, either him as the person, or the Avodah that he's doing, or the Begadim that he has, is all, Kadesh Lashem is all designated to the Abishter. But, you can't have, as Rashi is going to explain in a second, you can't have Hashem's name under. You can't have Hashem's name under. And so because it had to be two lines, you know, Kadesh Lashem, you had to actually read it from bottom up. You actually read it, Kadesh Le Hashem, on top. Okay, let's read Rashi. Rashi, number two. Kaloimar. We mean to say, Hashem, Hashem Shalem was Bishita Oyoina. The full name was on the upper row. The Kodesh Lamid was Bishita Tachtoina on the lower row. Why? We don't want to put other letters above the shame. This is the Tanakama of the Brisa. However, he's not the final word. Then you have one of the Tanoim, named Rabbi Eleazar Ber Yoisi. This is sometime during the second century that he uh, is living, as we'll soon see in a second. He lives at the same time as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So it's a generation after Rabbi Akiva. And he writes, I need the Isi Bi'eroimi. I saw the tzitz. Yeah. I saw the tzitz in Rome. He says, Kosov Kodesh Hashem B'shita Achas. However, you guys have it wrong. You think that it was written on two lines. I saw the tzitz in Rome. And this... Uh, fits into a tradition that some or all, but probably some, of the Inyanim of the Beis Hamikdash, the Kalim of the Beis Hamikdash, ended up being taken to Rome. He says, I saw it there, and it was on one. When was he in Rome? So, very briefly, in number four, I'll summarize what the Gemara says in Me'ila. The Gemara says in Me'ila that one time the Roman government passed a law in Eretz Yisrael that uh, Jews should not uh, keep Shabbos. We know from other sources, Hellenist sources, that they had a big problem with Shabbos because they felt that that meant you were lazy. The, uh, Mila, we know also that the Hellenists, the Greeks, and then later the Romans as well, had a big problem with Mila because the body had to be perfect and the idea of compromising uh, the body uh, was something that was a value they disagreed with. And the third one was mikvah here. Here, this is unique. You don't have this in many of the other sources. The idea of that they should not, um, that, that uh, women should not be able to go to mikvah, which means Taras and Meshpach should not be kept. So the Gemara describes how there was a man by the name of Rabbi Uvein ben Istrobli, and how he dressed up like a Roman. It says he took a Roman haircut and everything. He disguised himself, and he comes to lobby in Rome. And he basically tells them... Um, Look, we hate the Jews. We're anti-Semites. We hate the Jews. So if you hate the Jews, you might as well do legislation that harms them. So if you tell them, if you, if you, if you allow them to keep Shabbos, who are they harming? They're harming themselves. They can come poor. If you tell them that, they, uh, the, that, they, that uh, you keep Tars and Mishpacha, so that means for more, uh, for more days in a month, they're not having relations. So there'll be less children, this is what he said. And uh, Mila, you become weaker. So what do we care? Let them do these things. They're harming themselves. So everyone says, oh, you know something? You're right. It makes a lot of sense. We should let the Jews do this because it's, they're self-harming and so this is fine. When they later found out that this uh, Reb Ruvain was really a Jew who disguised himself so they, they felt tricked. And so all the laws snapped back on and they put all the regulations. So now the Jews in Israel have to figure out what they're going to do. So they said, we need to send a new delegation. Who's the delegation going to be? Reb Shimon Ba'yechai. Why? Because Hashem Ben Yechai is a miracle worker, so we're going to send him. 
then who is he going to go with? So they like obviously we need to send them with someone. So they chose Rabbi Lazar bar Rabbi Yossi. They chose this time Rabbi Lazar bar Yossi. Why? There is no explanation given in the Gemara why they specifically chose him, but they chose him. Anyway, they go. They come to Rome. The emperor, no name is given, but the emperor's daughter is uh, is sick with some sort of spirit, and they heal her, and they get the spirit out of her, and so the emperor says, whatever you guys want, I'll grant your wish. So to do that, the emperor brought them into the place where he has all his treasures. And that's where they found the document that had this gzera, and they tore it up. And so the Gemara says, and that's when Rabbi Lazar Ben Rabbi Yaisi saw the items from the Beis Hamikdash, because we have another Gemara where the same Rabbi Lazar Ben Yaisi says there's a discussion about on the the service on Yom Kippur with the blood, whether when they would sprinkle the blood it had to hit the parochas or not. So he said, oh, I saw it in Rome, and I saw there was blood on it. So the Gemara says it was during this event. So now we know why he was in Rome, and we know when he saw the tzitz. How did he see the tzitz? Because he was allowed into the chambers of, 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 of all of the, of, of the, of the emperor's uh, treasures because of this uh, specific story. Okay, fine. So here, is, it's not unusual. We have a debate in the Gemara, two different shittas, about how something uh, ought to be, or was, in this case, how it was. <clears throat> Who's the Allah like? So go to section 2, the Rambam. The case of all of Shnei Shit in Kodesh Lashem. You write it in two lines. Kodesh Momata, Lashem Omaili. He actually has a little bit of a different version. Where there's no Lamid on the bottom line, just says Kodesh, and then on the higher word, on the upper line it said Le Yud Ke Vav Ke. In terms of how we got there and whatever, and the difference between our Gemara that's not our subject for right now. However, so what do you see here? You see an amazing thing. The Rambam Paskins, like the Tanakama. Even though you have someone, a trustworthy source, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Yossi, saying that he saw the thing itself and it was written on, on, on one line. Nonetheless, the Rambam feels that the Tanakama didn't change his mind. The, 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 the meaning Tanakama is a nameless person. So therefore we call it usually the Chachamim, meaning everyone, everyone held that. And in other words, they didn't change their mind because of what Rabbi Lazar bar Rabbi said. And Rambam defense, thinks that they're right and says Allah is like them. Even though to use modern technology, the archaeological evidence went the other way. Okay. Then the Rambam continues and says, if, however, you did write it in one line, it's kosher. And the Rambam goes on to say, and sometimes it was taka written in one line. So Rabbi Yisuf Karo, the Kesef Mishnah, analyzed what's going on over here. On the one hand, he paskined, it should be in two lines. On the other hand, he says, it's okay, but he it if it's on one line. And it sometimes happened that it was like that. So the Kesef Mishnah explains, Pasak Tanakama. First of all, you should know he paskined like the Tanakama, that it's two lines. And this that he says that one line is okay, neither it seems to me the high numid the Amar Rabbi Lazar Rabbi Yosi and neither Yisiv. This is because of Rabbi Lazar's testimony where he said he saw it. Ah, for God, the halacha like the Tanakama. Though we say the halacha like the Tanakama, the halacha chila. But the Eved Mia halacha Rabbi Lazar Rabbi Yosi. But the Eved, you can follow that shit. Why? Because you have something to rely on. What? One Tana saying he saw it that way. Good enough to rely on a the Eved. Or metam zekasuv. And um, that's why he wrote That's why the Rambam writes. Sometimes they wrote it in one line. Because this rabbi saw it. Obviously, in other words, Rambam is trying to explain what happened over here. How is it that a rabbi saw it on one of the Tanoim, saw it written on one line? The answer is. So one day, the goldsmith who they gave the keli to, who was making it, made it that way. And like, oh, you did it. Okay, fine. But the is kosher. And so they kept it. And that's the one that ended up in Rome. But really, the Allah is like the Chacham. And this is how the Kesef Mishnah understands. Huh? That's right. Actually, you make wow. one. You think no, Even if they did make it all same, it seems strange that they would keep it as Bidyevet. Yes. Like, I, this is something that everything they made most, like... Are you saying it's a stretch? Yeah, and a garment. Yeah, you maybe have a backup. I don't know. It's a metal. What if an, each new you can you can't imagine every kind of gold coming along and saying, I don't want to use his. I want to make my own. I want to make a new one. I want to make a new one. Huh? Not the fit. That's the parayches. That's the Huh? Maybe that's the fit. Oh, so that's a finish. No, but still, why would they yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like a. Hmm? Why would they keep it's, it? It's 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 it, it, indeed it is bizarre. 
uh, I think that the Rambam felt that he, this was the best way of explaining what happened here. But on the one, Rambam is torn. On the one hand, it's clear from the account in the Mishnah, in the, from the teaching, it's very clear that the Chachamim didn't change their mind, as we're going to soon see. So therefore he says, Allah is like them, and we, generally we follow the majority. On the other hand, there's got to be some legitimacy to him, and it, after all, didn't he see something? So his theory is, this is his solution. L'chatzil should have been this way, but the evidence okay, and that's why it once happened that it ended up this way. You see, the Rebbe is going to offer an alternative way of understanding what's happening. Okay, now the Me'iri, when he talks about this, brings out a very important point. The fact that the halacha follows the Chachamim despite the archaeological evidence. Why? Says the Me'iri, Although from the greatest ages testify, Aniri isi veroimi, I saw it in Rome because of all of Kaidish Lashem Bishita Achas and it's on one line. Nonetheless, they didn't go against, they didn't cancel what they knew, even though they had Edus Ria, even though they had this testimony, they didn't go against what they knew. Where do they know it from? Where do they know it from? Obviously, obviously they heard it from their parents. Who heard it from their parents or their parents? So in other words, what the Me'iri is saying over here, when there's a conflict between tradition and an eyewitness testimony about an archaeological discovery, what wins, what prevails, what prevails is the tradition. This is what the Me'iri uh, says. And the Rampa explains uh, this uh, point. It goes a little bit di- different direction from the way the Rambam spoke about, uh, spoke about it. The Rambam, the Rebbe gives an alternative. In other words, rather than saying that there was once a tzitz that was made in this way and it was used and his video evidence. No, the Rebbe gives an alternative theory for how you ended up having this tzitz in Rome. Says the Rebbe, Ah, for Peter Belez, Rabbi said, Gazana tzitz in Rome, is the sovereignty, can I a brura, thus is given that tzitz, or can Golo? You don't, any, any time you are doing archaeology or anything of the sort, you always need an element of interpretation. In other words, there is no clear and ab- absolute evidence that this was actually used by the Kohen Gobel. As Ken Zayin, as us is given a tachshit, was emis er gemacht in a tzir, was is ksas doim, it's unsitz, it could be, so I made a knockoff. Der noch, is out there tachshit for a late givar, and it got put away, so zamim, it declare a miktosh, zayin, and galagin, and it made its way to Rome, and you can come up with a hundred different explanations of how or why it happened, but at the end of the result, these are all possibilities. Because the rabbis had a tradition, as the Me'iri says, what was known, as the Verte Kedesh Lashem, that it was written on two lines, so obviously this is the way it was. So therefore, they easily said, what you saw wasn't the real thing. We have this tradition, you saw something, sorry, it's not enough of evidence to bring into this conversation. Okay, what about Rebbe Lezab Rabbi Did he disagree with that? Remember, he's testifying, and he's looking, he's carrying, and, 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 he, and he's talking about it. So, so, so the Rebbe says, very interesting thought. By Rabbi Eliezer, by Rabbi Yitzhi Atzmai, he himself was there, Nitzkat, the Kabbalah from San Rabbi. He didn't have, this is what the Rebbe is suggesting, he didn't have a tradition. His teacher never told him what the tzitz was like in the thing. So when he does do his archaeological dig, he's not beholden to any tradition. And so therefore, he's able to say, I don't, I don't have to fall back on a vaita meglechkeit, is what the Rebbe is saying, on a remote possibility. So in other words like this, to bring the discussion to today. If I'm an archaeologist and I don't have tradition, and I find something, I'm free to interpret it the way I want. And, and if the best interpretation that I have in my hand is such and such, then fine, so be it, right? Because there's nothing pulling in the other direction. And that was the story for Rabbi Lezab Yesi. And so therefore, he doesn't have to re- go to a remote. The Rebbe is saying it's a remote possibility. A remote possibility doesn't mean it can't happen. It just means statistically, it's, it's, it wouldn't happen often. Remote possibility doesn't mean it can never happen. But the Chachamim, if you have tradition, if you are, and right, and Judaism is all about tradition... So, if you have a tradition that it was in a certain way, then, for, to the contrary, you're going to look at that, you're going to laugh at it, you're going to say, what's that? 
you're going to fall back on the remote possibility and say, this isn't the real thing. And it was never used in the base of Mitzvah. Not like the Rambam that maybe it was. It was never used in the base of Mitzvah. It was just a knockoff for whatever type of explanation may be given. This is the way the Rebbe understands what the Me'iri is saying and why the Chachamim therefore disagreed with uh, uh, um, the Rabbi Lazar and why, and why the Rambam ruled in that way. Okay. This, the Rebbe spoke to the Sicha, Parshas Tetzave, Tav Shin Mem Gimel, 1983, and other of 1983. All right. Now, the next year, they prepared the Sicha for the Rebbe to be Magiyaet. So this is Tetzave, Tav Shin Mem Dalu. The reason I'm saying this is because I just, in, in the, during this process, found something interesting that I'll share soon. So that's why I'm giving you the date. So the Rebbe was Magiyaet this for the next year. When the Rebbe spoke about the Sicha, he just said everything that we said till now. When the Rebbe was Magia, the Sikha, it looks like, from as far as I can tell, he added an entire paragraph at the end that's about the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls is something we can talk about for ten different uh, classes, and maybe we will continue on related subjects in future weeks, but we're going to have to keep the conversation focused uh, on what we want to do today. Very briefly, just for the background, is that in 1947, they find a few scrolls, in uh, the Judean desert. At the time, it was under the British still in Eretz Yisrael. At the time, there were five or so scrolls that were found. It was an Isaiah scroll and another one or two. Uh, I don't remember exactly. And then, over the years, there were more and more digs that were happening in this area, in the area called Qumran. And there were, Sahakal, I think, 11 caves that were found to have scrolls in them. And they became a major um, a subject of fascination. Many people around the world were very curious because what was said at the time was that these date back to the time of the end of Bayesheni, the end of the Beis HaMikdosh, the second Beis HaMikdosh. And so Christians were interested if they're going to find stuff related to their uh, religion, and Jews were obviously uh, interested, uh, and the historians were interested, in, and there's, uh, there's just a, a, a wealth of, uh, of, um, of, of relevance in this, uh, in this cachet. And a lot of discussion about it. Who wrote them? Why were they written? Why were they put there? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all of that. Uh, we will talk about who wrote them uh, uh, momentarily. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in some of these scrolls, we're looking now at a scroll of Tehillim. So look at number 10. I, uh, here's two images. I, 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 we, um, I'm giving you here under the way it's written. So you don't have to read it in the original if you don't want to. But you see it says, Tefillah Ladavid Arei Mimcha. And then there are four unrecognizable uh, letters. We'll talk about that soon. Elikai, Hamelech, Vavarcha, Shimcha, Leilavad. So what is this? We all recognize this right away. This is Ashrei. But you also recognize here that it's written differently from the way we have Ashrei in Tehillim. Instead of Tehillah Ladavid, it says Tefillah Ladavid. Instead of David without a Yud, it's David with a Yud. Now, by the way, in Divrei Ayamim, we always have David spelled in our Tanakh with a Yud. But in the rest of Tanakh, it's never spelled with a Yud. Here it's spelled with a Yud. Aremimcha is spelled a little differently. Uh, Shimcha, instead of a long Chaf, is a Chaf and a He. Okay. Um, and then right after this Pasuk, it says, Baruch. Um, oh, okay, before we do that, what is this XXX? So this is the symbols that I put in. The old Hebrew script that was used during uh, the time of Bayez Rishon was not Ksav It was not the square script, square script that we use today. The script that was used during the time of Bayez Rishon was known as Ksav Ivri. Gemara discusses uh, this. It was a different skip, script, also had 22 uh, letters. And uh, this is Shem Hashem. And for whatever reason, we're not going to get into it right now, because no one knows for sure, it's only speculation, they were writing Shem Hashem in the old script. Even though they, during the time of Bayez Shani, these people or these authors were changed to the Ashuri script, but for God's name, the holy Yud Kevavke, they kept it in the old Ivri script. So that's what you have here. Now, so back in the thing, after the first Pasuk, you have Baruch Hashem, Ovar Hashemayi Lo'ilam Vod. Okay, we obviously don't have that. Then you have Baruch Yom Avar Cheka, which, number one, doesn't make sense, but number two is different from what we have. We have Bechol Yom Avar Cheka, V'Allah Shimcha, notice again, Shimcha Lo'ilam Vod. Then again, Baruch Hashem, Uvaruch was added in, in the middle line, Shemayi Lo'ilam Vod. God El Hashem, can't make out the thing over there, but let's assume it says, there is no Vav there. Ligdulasai, Ein Cheker. Okay? Baruch Hashem, Baruch Shmei, Lenavad. 
then, okay, the next one is not direct continuation. I'm jumping. You'll see, again, no langachov. Malchus koil with a vav, oilamim, om shaltacha. Again, they're allergic to the langachov. Behold, there a door. Barach Hashem, Barach Hashem, And then, the missing nun that we don't have in Ashrei. We have all of the 22 Aleph Bays in our, um, in, in, we do, of all of the letters in Aleph Bays, our Ashrei is missing the letter nun. And much has been written about that. And here you have, Nemon Elekim Bidvarov, the Chasid Bechoyal Masav. Chasid Bechoyal Masav you have earlier in Ashrei. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to imagine that. Later. Th- okay, maybe it's later. Simon later. Simon. It's hard to imagine that the same poem would use the same phrase twice, <coughs> but here you have it. And then Barak Hashem Barak Hashem Okay, so there's a few things that we need to discuss over here. First of all, what's this Barak Hashem Barak Hashem So most people don't assume that this is a this is a version of Tehillim that's like, oh, this is Tehillim. The assumption is that this was a Tehillim that was uh, used for liturgical purposes. And used for liturgical purposes in a shul or some sort of setting, it was, this added Pasuk was given, so you have a chazan saying, and then a call responding, but uh, that's Papashtos, what this Barak Hashem of Barak Shmoy Lo'olam Void is. Okay, so once we put that aside, what, what, where, where, where does that leave us? That leaves us here with two things. Number one, you have a significant difference with our Tehillim in the fact that the letter Nun is presented here. And um, there you could go two ways. One way you could go and say is that the author was like, hey, come on, it's not fair that Asher doesn't have a letter Nun. We've got to fix this. And so it was fixed, right? And evidence for that approach would be that he lacked originality uh, by adding V'chasid B'chol Masav, which he had earlier. Or maybe there was a version of Ashrei that had all of the things, including Nun, and this is it. And we uh, found it, right? So can you prove one way or the other? Uh, I don't know if one could prove one way or the other. Beyond that, what do you have here? One more thing is all the spellings. Is the spellings where especially there's a, um, uh, a tendency to go much more mullet than, uh, than, than we have. And so the question becomes, so what relevance does this have to the way we think about or spell or whatever are Tehillims? And this is not just here in Tehillim. This is true for other areas in uh, Tanakh as well. Though I, just, I once heard, a, I, I mentioned this before, I'll say it again, um, Professor Schiffman was once giving a talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and he said, people ask me, are there differences between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the way they, um, and the, the way our Tanakh, the way we have it. He says, let me get thing one, uh, one thing off the table. It does not say you shall commit adultery. All right, fine. Anyway, but uh, you do end up having these types of uh, things. So the question is, how are we supposed to think about this? Yeah. Why does Nashi have a nun? Why does Ashrei not have a nun? So the Gemara discusses and says that the nun represents a negative uh, thing. The question is, what does that mean? Because you can also have positive. So it's a whole topic for itself. But the Gemara does say that it represents negativity and we didn't want to include it. In the well, all the other schools that were found have the same amount of, of differences like you've shown here? Not all, but a number of them. Oh. Yeah. Feel 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 yeah, the Malays especially. Right. Okay, so let's see. So the Rebbe added, remember, he spoke to Sikha about the Tzitz the previous year. The next year he's editing the Sikha and he uh, adds the following paragraph. From what we discussed above about the tzitz, we have a hayra for our day. In the recent times, they found caches of scrolls related to Tanakh. The Rebbe doesn't want to call it Tanakh. In Yonah Tanakh. And there are numerous differences about our tradition, especially about Chaser, Yater, etc. Okay. Dar from this, as the Gnizos, Chaser is then always an Eidos Riyah. Remember, the Eidos Riyah is the language that the Meiri used for Rabbi Lezim and Rabbi Yaisi. Although, it looks like you have over here, you saw this since in Rome. Then is a clown, Nita Zavi, Unzer Mesoida. They don't compare, they don't have the strength as the tradition. We don't know who the authors were, just like the Rebbe there said. Maybe the Sitz was a knockoff Sitz, so you could say similar thing here. Who are these people? The Russian of the Meiri was. He used Rebbe Lazar Ben Yesi, he described Rebbe Lazar Ben Yesi, the one, the archaeologist, 
Rabbi Lazar bar Rabbi with the tzitz, he called him, he called him Dalach Chachamim. There, at least you have Dalach Chachamim. Here, you don't even even know if you have Dalach Chachamim other than it. In other words, you don't. Who, who's behind this? Wise people, not wise people. Ignoramus is right. We don't know. Nachmer, moreover. As Ken Gorzain, it's possible as a Megillah is an enigma given in Taka Dafar. They were buried specifically because his anigma should be given in the like halacha they were written uh, inappropriately. Hashem came to inside of us, Mirabin, however, the tradition. Which comes from person to person. All the way back to Moshe. Now, if you want to come back to the point that I said before, I think it's okay for someone to say. We, we don't have kindness to someone who's an archaeologist, and the rules of archaeology lead them to certain conclusions. God bless you, right? You don't have anything pushing you in other directions. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But the Rebbe's point is that when you do have a tradition, and Yiddishkeit is fully about the tradition, it's fully about linking to the past, and it's not something, we, you know, we don't believe that our ancestors got drunk and this is what ended up happening. We believe that this was a legitimate thing that got passed down from generation to generation. When you have that, then that takes precedence over something that there are many different ways of, as you want to call it, explaining or spinning or whatever it is to say how it's not, um, how it's not uh, definitive. Now, um, <clears throat> in this regard, by the way, for example, I'll just give you an example. To hold. There's a whole discussion about the Dead Sea Scrolls, about the concept of a vulgar text. What does a vulgar text mean? Today we have Nukudis. In those days, they didn't use Nukudis. There's never, there's never been writing... There is a discussion about Nikudis when they date. The bottom line is there's never been an item found with Nikudis from that gen. So, how do you, you know, today, you, we, what would you do if you want something that should be easily, readily available for the masses to read? So you add Nikudis to it. Then what did you do? So what you do is you do Malays. The Malays help you read it. Like the David, you can read Doid. With the Yud there, you know it's David, right? So adding that Yud helps. And likewise, there are a lot of the Malay things make it much easier to read it uh, properly. So there's a whole theory of the vulgar text that many of these scrolls were not meant to be in the shul that you rent, a kosher to say Torah that you use on Shabbos. It was meant for the chadorim or for the schools or for whatever it is. And so if that's the case, so then they added all those things. Just like you added Nikut, they added and they made a... So for example, that's an example of the type of thing where before people jump and start making conclusions... That's, a, that's just one. There are probably another many different factors that are similar to that that ought to be taken uh, into consideration. Like I said about the nun. The nun. The person say, oh, here you have evidence that there was once a nun. Maybe Fakar. Maybe there was no nun. And if someone was, you know, he was a, a little OCD. And he's writing a scroll. It doesn't make sense. So he maybe put in the nun later. There's no way, real way to know. So these are the types of factors that the Rebbe is saying that the tradition is stronger against these types of things. The interesting thing is that uh, the Rebbe cites a, a, a analog to this discussion about tefillin. What do I mean? This idea of saying, you know, maybe that's why they were buried, actually has precedence and came up way earlier, a few hundred years, uh, years ago. Why? The Smag, Ramosha of Kutsi, who lived in the 1200s, one of the Baleatoises, he writes that Nog, who beheaded Adam Eretishmo, Ashkenazim and Svardim. Jews in the Holy Roman Empire and in Spain, they follow when it comes to Tfilin, Rabbeinu Shloimeh, Chudir Rabbeinu Moshe, Rashi and the Rambam, the same shit on how you order the four Parshias, and everyone follows them. I, Rabbeinu Tam, you have to remember, they're living under the shadow of Rabbeinu Tam, who's the biggest authority. They're living, and you not follow Rabbeinu Tam? Yeah, we don't follow Rabbeinu Tam. This is what he says. And they sent a note. He doesn't say who, and he doesn't say when. But he says, a note came from Eretz Yisrael, but we know by the 1200s they had it. That a bima, I don't know what that means, some sort of stage. Why is there a stage on a, on a caver? There's another problem with this text, because that there's no caver Yecheskel in Eretz Yisrael. Caver Yecheskel is in Iraq. Um, but maybe, it bima shall cover Yecheskel in Iraq, and they found out about it in Eretz Yisrael, the Matzushan Tzulun Yishenim Oed, and they found old Tzulun there, and it was Kisidra, so Rabbeinu Moshe Rashi, and so therefore, they found like, so here you have, like, <laughs> he's using archaeology, the Smag is using archaeology to say, that with Tzulun, better go with the Rashi and Rambam's way than going with Rabbeinu Tan. Comes along a few hundred years later, the Bach, Bayez Chadash, <clears throat> right, he's in the in the late 15, early 1600s, and he says, "V'yesh doichin." What type of evidence is that? Maybe the lefid of sulim have ugamzul l'sham. Maybe because they were disqualified sulim, because they were no good, that's the way they were buried. Okay, so this is the same. The ba- 
so the, this is not the box argument. The box says some people are saying this. That's exactly, in other words, once you, you're digging something out of the ground, who knows why it was put there, and so how could you really interpret it? But the box says this is not a good argument in his case. Why? Here, I don't like this argument. You don't need to bury puzzle to fill in. All you need to do is take the parshas out and reorder them. So why would you have to uh, uh, bury it? Which is only true for... The Shorosh, where you could cha- change order. For the Shoyad, it's written on one scroll, so I don't think that's really true. There's a discussion about this. But the bottom line is that you see there's this argument of maybe that's why it was buried. Okay, for the Tzfilin, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, but it's an argument that came up uh, a few in the Rebbe references in the footnotes. Statistically speaking, going back to the Rebbe's point, uh, why, you don't know why, and uh, now with the Tzfilin, most Tzfilin were probably kosher. There's a small percentage of Tzfilin that were Puzzle, and that's why you get put in Gnesia. And the same thing with these Molly and Chasser, like for special occasions you would use it. To say that that's the only ones we're finding, like statistically speaking, that's a much smaller chance than the Kusher ones. Like, I have a hard time thinking tradition that's passed down, like broken tel- telephone. I'm just trying to, like, there was thousands of peers of film, maybe a 3% are ones that you do in Gnesia, and that's the one we found. The chance of that happening is not smaller than the ones we found are actually real peers of film. The same thing with, with this Malin Chaser. How many w- different kind of sidur- um, whatever uh, uh, scrolls do they create for these special occasions? Very like so. I still think, statistically speaking, it's it's not necessarily the case. You would have to take a very good look at the scroll by scroll, how much variation there is. There is th- there there is three b- broad classifications when it comes to scrolls that they that they give. One is, and one of the classifications they call is proto, proto um, Masoretic, which means it's very close to the Masoretic within. See, if, and then there are others that are a little further away from that. I, you have to take the numbers. So there are people who've done this, looked at the numbers or whatever. I, I didn't, I didn't to spend that time. But yeah, you would have to, if you're inter- the other thing to, that's one element. The second thing you have to recognize is all of these scrolls were found in the same place. So you don't have like a... You know, it's like if you go to if you if you go to Kiryas Joel and ask them who they're voting for, I mean, you're going to get a very lopsided, right? So you're you're getting one voice, especially if you if the consensus is that there it is one voice. Yeah, so you don't have um, from all over, from north, south, and all over Eretz Yisrael. So that's where you end up so having this discounted me a little bit, yeah. but the, the fact that the ones you found and the percent. I, I mean, I think this is stronger. In my view, seeing it... Weren't they specifically preserved? Like, for example, he went to the, what's called in Rome, and he found the, the... like. How many were there? So maybe one was wrong, and one that he found... The Rebbe himself used the words remote. Remote possibility. Right. But as re- remote as the possibility is, tradition is so strong that it should... It, it, that's... Right? Okay, yes. The Rebbe said about the sits it's a remote possibility. But... but tr- but tradition kind of pushes you in that way. In other words, every person in life relies on remote possibilities to make things sense. Everyone has to do it. And what are the things that push you toward remote possibilities? Well, it could be you love this person so much that you're going to say that maybe the reason he did this and this is remote possibilities. Why? Because of your love relationship with that person. So it's the same thing. If you have a serious love relationship and a committed with, and an understanding on, of what tradition is and all of that, then you end up with this, uh, with, uh, with this type of thing. There have been an name about um, the same theory from Prav Suvadaka. So yeah. does take it. Uh, did I get to take it as olive instead of a hay? Yeah. If you quote the Kabbalah, the two Yeah, so there is a. There, it's a bridge of both. Yeah, so the, uh, part, really, there's a whole. So, uh, there's a sub conversation here. Another, another part of the conversation is forget the Dead Sea Scrolls a second. Well, you know, today, if you take Sifrei Torah and Kisra Yad of Chomashim, that weren't buried. You'll find there's still yeah. variations. There's variations. So the shy is how do you deal with that? Okay. That's a, a separate uh, also, thing. Aleph and a hey. Some have it this way. There's a vav in the, in the parsha's nerf. Some have a vav, some don't have a vav. So you, but here you have a heart. You can't say what the Rebbe is saying here. You can't really say about that. Right? Also, the essence were not as mainstream. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get there yet. We didn't go. Talking about who it was, we'll get there soon. Menachem, you're still... Uh, no, so Matthew, still? Matthew, uh, the, uh, the actual, the, uh, the actual scrolls, they, they differ from one from another in their... In their yes, yes. No, they're not all the same. There's variation among them. Seems like Chila, the whole thing's questionable. Yeah. There's no consistency yeah. among them. No, there is no internal consistency. Okay. Uh, let, let's, let's, make a little more, let's make a little more progress. 
Okay, and then we'll do uh, a little time for questions. Okay, I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip section Dalit uh, due to time because I want to uh, move to hey. If we have time, we'll come back to Dalit. All right. So in the Sikha, the Rebbe wrote. We don't know who wrote them. I want to focus on that. We don't know who wrote them. Uh, <clears throat> amongst the the scrolls, there are different areas of interest. One area of interest is people want to learn Tanakh. If you want to learn Tanakh, so there's every book has at least a few words that were found, except for Megillah Sest. Every book has a few words that were found, or sometimes more than a few words. So therefore, if you're interested from a Tanakh angle, you have all angles. That's one cast. Then there's a whole other area. We know that what Chazal calls Sfarim Chitzoinim. Sfarim Chitzoinim were books that were written by Jews, for Jews, but they, uh, and maybe the authors wanted them to, so to speak, make it into the Tzuvim, the last section of the Tanakh, but they were rejected by Chazal and they were not included in, in the canon, in the biblical canon. These are called Sfarim Chitzoinim. For example, the book of Maccabees, for example, there are others. So there's a whole, many of these were found, uh, so people are interested in what's called the Apocrypha, so they can cough in that part. Then there's a third category. Third category is just regular writing. Regular writing. So we're going to turn now to some of the regular writing. There was a letter the, that is known in Dead Sea Scroll literature as MMT. They call it, scholars call it Mixus Maisei Torah, because it uses that word in the document. And you see an image of it here in number 16. And the general thrust of this document says, you guys are all bad. This is what it says. You guys are all bad because you say this. And you're bad because you say this. And you're bad because you say this. And there's a whole list of a whole bunch of things. We're going to focus on two of the things that it says there. You're bad because of you say this. And it's, you'll be able to tell right away. It gets into legal matters. So let's read the text over here. Va'afal ha moitzekos. Moitzekos um, means to pour. Pouring liquid. Anachnoimrim, we say, Shehem, Shehem, Bahem, Tara. Okay, we're not going to uh, worry too much about the Hebrew writing here, but they're, they're, not, they're impure. And the pure, this pouring liquid, Enam Avdilois, doesn't divide between the Tome and the Tar. Because the moisture of Amakabo Mehema and the recipient came, Lecha Achas is like one uh, moisture. Okay. So if someone doesn't have background in halacha and Gemara and Mishnah, or whatever, you look at this, it's impossible to make sense what is going uh, on over here. But uh, we'll make sense of it soon. This is one thing. Now go to the next page, 17. Here, this, it, this text is a little harder uh, to read. As you can tell, in both cases, the texts are damaged um, and aren't. So sometimes there's always an element of scholarly guessing in terms of figuring what the missing words are, which either you're right or you're wrong. Okay. Next one, Afal Taras Paras Achatos. This we know what it's talking about because we know the Torah speaks about the red heifer, and that's it calls it a Paras Achatos. Hashaychet Oisa va'asoyref Oisa. Notice the spelling. Va'oisef Hashafra, the one who burns it and the one uh, who slaughters it, the ones who burns it, the one who gathers its ashes. Va'hamaze Esmei Achatos and the one who sprinkles it. Lachol Eila for all these. Va'arevet Hashem Esliyus Tohirim. They need to wait for sunset to be tar. B'shel Yia Tar Mazal Atomei so that the pure person is sprinkling on the impure person. Okay, here we understand quite well what's uh, going uh, on over here, but to really understand what's happening over here, you need to, we need to know Chazal. So let's look at the Mishnah. Say the Mishnah. The Mishnah number 18. The Mishnah on Yedayim quotes the follows. Oimrin Tzedukim. The Mishnah quote says, the Tzedukim say, Koivlim Anu Aleichem Prushim. We complain to you Prushim. Prushim, we'll talk more if we have time about the word later, if we have time. For now, Prushim just means Chazal. So we complain to you, Chazal, the Tzedukim. Say, we remember the Tzedukim of the Sadducees is a group in the time of Second Beis Hamikdash that rejects the authority of the rabbis, they reject Tereh Shabbat Peh, etc., etc. They say, we uh, uh, complain to you, Prushim Sha'atem Metarim Esan Nitzoik, that you are Metar the Nitzoik. What's Pshat in this mission? Of Pshat the mission is like this. Let's imagine here, I have a cup of water. Okay. And here, let's say this is Tommy. All right, it was uh, Tommy. It was in a tent with a dead person, and now this is Tar, and now I go like this. So right now that's a nitzoy, and it's it's a connected flow. You see, there's a connection that's going. So the question is, does it the tumor rise up and make this Tommy? That's the question. So we have a lot of dinim and tumor and Tara. This is the shaila. Really, it's a question in kashras also. If you have 
a pig soup over here, and you have kosher chicken soup like this, and you're pouring, and it's connected like this, does the pig soup make the chicken soup trace? It's the same exact uh, question. So, what does Chazal say? They say, Ata metar Chazal are metar, which means all this nitzayk is tar. It's tar. Meaning, when does it become tome? When it gets into the walls. But this flow that's right here is still tar. Allah has kama kama. This cup is tar. The tzedukim say, how you talking? Really, the tumma should travel up the stream and it should make the upper cup tummy. This is the, the tzedukim want to be more machmir. This gets into a whole other subject because sometimes we hear about the tzedukim and we think they want to be more makel. Here you see, it's not like that and this is a complicated subject that we're not going to get into right now. Here you see the tzedukim are saying, what's going on over here? You're making uh, kulis. Look at this kula you're making. Now go back to that text that you saw before from the Dead Sea Scrolls, from MMT. Now we know exactly what it's talking about here. We say, right? The flow is not tohar, going up. And that liquid does not divide on the bottom to the tohar at the top. The moisture of Amakabo Mehema and the recipient came Lechachas, it's all like one, and therefore the Tuma goes uh, up from the other one. The exact thing that the Mishnah says was a debate between the Tzedukim and the Prussian. And not only the Mishnah says there was a debate between the Tzedukim and the Prussian, the Mishnah says that they tie to us. Here you have a document that says, You guys are terrible, you're no good, and why? For th- this actual complaint is documented. The very complaint that Chazal say they had is documented in this uh, passage. Number one. Number two, the second thing about Parasachatas, look what Mishnah Para says in Pere Gimel. Zikne Yisrael, Zikne Yisrael, when they would make the red heifer, this is the Para Aduma and Ur, and someone was a uh, Tmei Meis, not only they had to wait, and not only they had to go to Mikvah, and now they also had to have sprinkled the red heifer. Zikne Yisrael Amatim, so they would, there were ten of them, right? Or there were nine of them. So these were not made often. Uh, the elder, the Jew, the elderly Jews, the Zakanim, they would go to Harazesim, the, the mountain of uh, oil. Uvesfila Yisham, there was a mikvah, and that's where they would uh, process the, make the paradu. Says the Mishnah, They would make the koyin who's burning the para, they would make him tame. How? They take a sheret and touch him with the sheret. Why? Because of the tzedukim. That people shouldn't think that, that they're right when they say, What's going on over here? When you read the Torah, it speaks about um, It says this multiple occasions. That what? Although you went to Mikvah on Tuesday morning, you have to wait till the sunset of that night, and only now that the day is over, in other words, you have to have because in the morning, you were, in t- you, were, you were tummy. You have to wait till the day is over. You start a new day, and now you're tar. So this is called Harev Shemesh. Chazal had a Kabbalah, that Harev Shemesh is, is important. You need to have it. But some things, you don't need it. For example, to eat Maeser Shani, you go to Mikvah, you're already allowed to eat Maeser Shani. Harev Shemesh is happening later in the evening. Doesn't you can already eat Maeser Shani now. Other things, not. Truma, no. So it's a whole list of when, yeah, when, no. And one of the traditions they had is that although it is true that the people working on the paraduma have to be tar, obviously, but it's kosher if they didn't have harav shemesh yet. It's kosher if they went to a mikvah and they didn't have harav shemesh yet. So the co- and the tzedukim were saying, Nishtazah, you're wrong. And this was a big flashpoint. There was a big fight. We know from many other sources and in these areas, one of the ways Chazal chose to battle the tzedukim was to parade the Apis, go out of their way to show that they were wrong. There are many examples of this we don't need to get into now. So here they did that too. What did they do? They made the ka- Tame. They made the Kayan Tame. He went to Mikvah right there, came up. Okay, he didn't have Harav Shemesh yet. Doesn't matter. According to Chazal, he's good. And they would do this the, the five, six, seven, eight times during Bayez Shani that they uh, needed to do the Paraduma. They did this uh, uh, during, uh, during that uh, time. And again, why? Because of the Tzedukim. Now go back to their text. You need to wait to Harev Shemesh when the Torah b'shal yia Torah mazal atomi so that the Torah you have a Torah a complete Torah the person who is sprinkling uh, on the impure uh, person and this is in the same document. Um, these are not only two examples. 
any time we, let's say, I don't know the number, but I'm going to just throw out a number. Let's say Chazal gave us 30 cases where Tzedukim argue with Chazal. Any time any of those cases surface in any of the Dead Sea Scrolls, every single time they're on the side of the Tzedukim. No exceptions. Every single time. Now, when was this discovered? This is an interesting thing. This was the main text that led people to realize this. Their halacha is tzeduki halacha, no question about it, there's no one who disagrees with that. Everyone is a consensus. Tzeduki halacha. You mentioned before the group of the Essenes, it's a, these are all debated. Are they this group or that group? One thing is not debated. Their halacha, they may, they may have called themselves who knows what. Their name, Vaismanish. But their halacha was tzeduki halacha. That's clear. When was this known? When MMT came out. When did MMT come out? It was announced in a conference in April 1984. In April 1984. Till then, no one knew its existence. Chlau, all the Dead Sea Scrolls, the scholars who were assigned, they kept them secrets, and they were working on them for years, and people were telling them what's going on. They were discovered in the 40s, 50s, 60s, where's everything? Nothing was published till the 90s. Nothing was published till the 90s, most of the stuff. It was big, there were court cases, there was a lot of, it was a big political issue about what was going on with the Dead Sea uh, Scrolls, the Jordanian government, the Israeli government, it's a long parsha. The bottom line is that the, the, the announcers had a conference in Yerushalayim, in 1984, in April. So why I find that interesting is when did the Rebbe talk about this? <laughs> Literally a few weeks earlier, uh, sorry, didn't talk about it, he added it in Bixav, into the Sikha, into Tzava of Mandalit, right before, right before. And what did he write there? He wrote, we don't know who wrote them, right? Okay. So we, we still don't know who wrote them, but one thing we seem to do know about them is that their halacha was Tzaduki, uh, was Tzaduki halacha. Okay. So uh, that's just another factor to keep in mind when thinking about uh, when thinking about this subject. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, some people you wanted to ask something. I was saying that the six looks like a much more simple situation. I mean, it's probably there's competing, you know, multiple kind of at the same time. The fusion of kind of the someone and the the chavim clearly have control over the kind of them. So there's probably at least five sits, you know, sits going around. So and the sukkim are probably more into I don't know. The culture or whatever, so like if I want to have on one line, it looks weird or two lines, like it makes so much sense to have different variations. That's very, you're, it's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting argument, I, no, I didn't think about that, that from what we know about the other Tzedukim, not these guys, because these Tzedukim that we see here are very from, and they like, both of them, they're saying Chazal to Mekel, right, to Yom, you, the, without, right, both of these, and by the way, in all of them. All of them, many, both in our tradition, is the Tzedukim are more machmer. On the other hand, we do have traditions of them being uh, almost like Greek um, uh, hedonists. There are some sources like that. And so you could have said that a, 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 a Tzeduki Kayan Gadol would say, I don't want it on two lines, especially with the bottom, Kodesh Lashem, that just doesn't look beautiful, so let me get it on one line, and maybe that's the sense up and wrong. That's an interesting theory. The Rebbe doesn't mention that, but that's, that's a fascinating idea. Wasn't well, yeah? like the thing about Tzedukim was that they were literalists? Yeah, so the question is, is that a little bit of a simplification? And uh, it's, it's possible that it is. It's possible that it is. Um, it says at night, at night. It says between the eyes. Right, the so, eyes. for example, we don't, we don't see in the sources between the eyes. We don't see that in the sources. Um, at night, each one of these you have to look at separately. It, it looks like, I don't know, it may have been a different way of... of, of I'm not, I'm not sure anyone could interpret the Bible literally. I, I don't think it's Shaykh, so I'm not sure. Yeah? What percentage of Jews were looking in those days? Or we don't know? It's a good question. Josephus says that the majority of Jews followed the Pharisees. He himself says he's a Pharisee, so maybe you say bias, but this is what he writes. Pharisees are Persian. Persian, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, is there a sheet in Lamar that, that says the way the Ramam does, that it's Kedish Lashem and Tudus No, but the Kesef Mishnah says a very interesting thing. He says, the Rambam chose to follow Gemara Shabbos, not Gemara Sukkah. That doesn't make sense to us. We're looking at Gemara Shabbos and Sukkah is both the same thing. And there is, we don't, all the, I looked at the, the manuscripts that are available, I looked, I didn't see any of them that match what he's saying, but it looks like the Beis Yosef had a manuscript of Gemara that did go in the, the other way. So, I mean, that's a mystery. It's the Fedish in the Mishnah. It's the in the Gemara, yeah. It's a Gemara. It's a Braitha. It's a Braitha, yeah. Yeah, so he must add a different version. You have to look more to see if there may be a different version. You have to look more. Okay, can we go right there? Ah? Uh? Yes. Yeah? Okay, so now, uh, with the few minutes we have remaining, we're going to, uh, first of all, about the name Prushim. It's 
that's where we'll see here on number Vav. So the name Prushim, just two things. What does it mean? So it's interesting. There are two traditional interpretations to the meaning of this word. One is the Rambam. Rambam talks about the fact that there is no din in the Torah to be Tom. tom. You, if a person wants, he could be Tom. Right? Can't go to base Amikdash, you can't eat Kachim, but you could be Tom if you want. Rambam says uh, there was a Midah, there's man of bias, to always remain Torah. Never to become Tommy. Why? It seems from, if you're always in a Torah, all of a sudden you get invited to a party, like, I can't go. I can't go. In other words, because the masses aren't going to do that. It, it creates with you, within you, it creates the idea of separation. And, and he said, that's holy. It's just so COVID. <laughs> <laughs> you vaccinated now. <laughs> so anyway, it's a way of being separated from the masses, which allows you to explore with the mind and to learn and all that. So he uses and he says, that were, those, that's why they were called Prussians. So why are they called Prusha? Because they were separated from the Amel or That's basically what you would say, as expressed in the Dinam of Tuma and Tara, or more generally. That's one interpretation. Then, then, then there's Yosifun. Huh? Then we say that not most Jews would be Prusha. Follow the Pharisees. Follow the Pharisees. Yeah. 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 Uh, then you have, on the other hand, you have Yosifun. Yosifun is the Jewish version of Josephus. And... Without, we had a class on it, so we're not going to go into it again right now. But the bottom line is that in this version, it says, they were called Prushim Malashim Mifarish. Because that's what they used to do. The Tzedukim were against what? what? Their Pirushim. They're, they used to be Mifarish, the Torah. And that's what they used to explain. So that's his interpretation. So those are the two meanings uh, for that. Okay. Now, let's back up just before uh, to the letter of the Rebbe that we skipped. We'll just do the... The, this is in the 1950s, in number 14, you'll see that Rabbi Zevin wrote to the Rebbe in 1905. Now at this time, there's only three, four scrolls that are known. It's one on Yeshaya, and then three other ones. One was not the biblical at all, and the other I don't remember right now. And this is all. This is all that's revealed. And so Rabbi Zevin writes to the Rebbe what his thoughts are about this. So the Rebbe writes back in 55, Benegel le Megillus Agnuzis, I didn't have a chance yet to, to investigate the debate amongst the historians here. Um, a lot was said already. At this time, there was a scholar named Saitlin, I think he had Lubavitch roots in Philadelphia, who said that it's not from temple times. He believed it was medieval. So, for example, this is all these discussions that are going on. They're ever saying, I didn't have a chance to look at this. There is... Debates from one extreme to the other. But from a, a shallow read, or a cursory read, and from seeing some of the images, the way the guy wrote in Malay, it seems like it's an ignoramus who wrote it. Who made a mistake? So number one, he's an artist. Number two, he's the type of person to make mistakes because he doesn't know things. You need to be really, really careful when it comes to relying on them. Who knows why they were uh, uh, concealed or put away. So that's, um, this is what the Rebbe says in the Sikha, in Mem, in Mem, uh, wrote into the Sikha Mem Dalid, uh, already way back in 1955, pretty much writing or saying, uh, the same, uh, the same thing. Uh, okay. Now, in a little spirituality uh, won't hurt, and so we'll conclude with a summary of a deep sicha in Chelek Lamed Zayin uh, about the Nitzvah. And the Rebbe basically says as follows: He says, "What is the symbolism of this, of the Nitzvah?" So he explains: the upper cup represents the Abishter, God; the lower cup represents us or the world, the whole world. And a person may think that this world is disconnected from God. The truth is it's not disconnected. This world is always connected with the Abishter. God recreates the world every second. That's symbolized by this Nitzvah, that connection. Okay, so that's point number one. At the same time, what do we say? The upper one could be Tar, and the lower one could be Tameh. In other words, but if you're connected... So the Rebbe explains that the meaning of this spiritually is like this. If we're connected to God every second, you would think that God is tar, so we're also tar. In other words, we, we don't have free choice. We're holy just like God. And the answer is, well, we do have that connection available to us, but we could go on a different path. The upper cup is tar, and we could be Tameh. Why? Because he gave us free choice. 
He gave us three choices. And therefore, the state of the upper cup doesn't dictate the state of the, of the lower cup. We could be on two different paths. The lower one is Tame, and the upper one is, uh, is uh, Tar. Okay. Then, what do we say? But if the lower one is hot, I didn't mention this before, but this is the Din, in Tuma and in Kashros, that if the lower one is hot, then it does travel up the stream, and it does invalidate the upper one. So that explains, what does that mean by that? Obviously, you can't talk about God becoming impure, so that's not on the table right now. But how could, what could we say over here? So it's like this, what is heat? The natural position of things is cold, right? Water on its own is cold. You need a human being to use his wisdom and effort to go and to light a fire and to make it hot. So hot, heat represents Avaidah Sa'adam. So you want to know when do you really connect to the Abishtar? So much so that you could even change something Lamaila through Avaidah Sa'adam. That's a human being is empowered that when he gets hot, that hits in Avaidah Sashem, Okay, you're not going to say that you're going to make it Lamaila Tome. Fine, not Tome. But you can have an effect Lamaila. What's the effect Lamaila? So to speak, God made himself vulnerable that his pain and pleasure, so to speak, depends on what we choose to do and what we don't do. So that's an amazing thing. That the lower, through being hot, then you have a pool of Lamaila in, in causing the Nachas Ruach to, to the Abishter. The Rebbe says, where does this happen? Mostly when you're Tome. We're talking about on the bottom is Tome. What does it mean when you're Tome? It's because when we make mistakes and we do things that are wrong, and then we do tshuva, that's the real effort. That's the real Avaidah Sa'adam. And that's the real thing that has a pa'ula lamayla. Again, not that a cup of kam tamay, but the point is that it can have a pa'ula giving the Ebishter a nachas ruach. Anyway, this is just one small angle into the vast uh, topic of the Dead Sea Scroll. There are many other areas of interest that are worth exploring, and maybe we'll use a... I don't know if any of you, were any of you at a class that I did a few years ago on a morning about the calendar? I did a calendar one. None of you are here, then we'll, maybe we'll do the calendar one next week. It's also fascinating. All right. Salah